Hello, New Holland. Uh, thanks for tuning in again. It's uh, good to have you with us. I'm not sure that I'm going to get used to uh, preaching to you this way. I hope I don't have to. I hope we're going to be back together real soon. Uh, welcome to our Palm Sunday service. I uh, wish we could be together, but um, we're praying for each other. We're going through this uh, trial in our world together. And I don't know what the people who don't have Jesus Christ to lean upon, I don't know what they're doing. I know they seem to be full of panic, and they're uh, wondering uh, if there is any hope. But we know we have a living hope. We have a Savior who can take such very good care of us. I, thank, I want to thank all the people who uh, tuned in with us this past Wednesday night for our Zoom time together and had a good prayer time. And uh, maybe we can do that more and get more people involved. We'll try to uh, give more people a little bit of a... Uh, a time where they can know when it is that we'll be Zooming together and praying together to where they can join us possibly and we can see each other. Even if it's just online, we can see each other then. So uh, I pray that today will be a blessing to you. Uh, I pray that you will have a, a wonderful time worshiping the Lord. Let, let me remind you, this is a worship time. This is a time we're going to come together. And though we're going to be separate, yet we're going to be one heart and, and one body. Uh, the body of Christ, we're going to be one soul together, and though we're in different places, yet we are one. I think about the, the great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. Maybe this will be a great encouragement to the ones who will follow after us as we're going to be going through this very unique time in our country. So uh, Brother Mark's going to lead us in some worship, and we've got our, a little bit of our praise team with us, and got some uh, instruments with us, and we're all doing the social distancing, staying uh, uh, separated but coming together to hopefully lead in what will be a wonderful worship time together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for allowing this. We want to praise you in the storm. We want to praise you for the time uh, that you've given us to draw close to you. I pray, Lord, that you will take New Holland and amplify the voice of New Holland like you never have before. Uh, Lord, thank you for keeping us safe and for the most part healthy. I know that this crisis has come uh, at a time that, that many are uh, observing Lent, where we are trying to uh, get other things out of our life so we can put our focus upon you. And my goodness, how we have had an opportunity to let our focus be upon you. So Lord, uh, may every day, may all day, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing unto you. May we walk our day, Lord, in such a way that you would receive all the honor and the glory. Once again, the, the prayer of John the Baptist, O oh Jesus, may you increase, and Lord, so that can happen, may we decrease. Father, we're not worthy to loosen the sandals on your feet, but Lord, you have called us blessed. You have uh, allowed us to uh, call upon you and find forgiveness of our sins, new life in Christ, uh, salvation, hope, heaven, and a friend, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Father, we take advantage of that. We take advantage of this opportunity of prayer. We take advantage of this time where we can worship together. And Lord, for all the people that will be uh, uh, tuning in to this, Lord, and, and, and hearing our time together, may they join in and worship you, my Lord, my God, my Savior. May they worship you with us. And Lord, uh, until the day that we see you face to face, Lord, may we be about your business and do it with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's worship together. God bless. All right, let's go.
All right, this is the gospel. He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life, the risen wonder. He is a shepherd, laying His life down for His sheep. He is a warrior, victorious warrior, speaking with voice of lightning, thunder, conquering sin and conquering death, Jesus the Sing it at home. Hosanna, Hosanna, prepare your heart for the way of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, prepare your heart for the way of the Lord. Amen. We're glad that you're with us this morning. We'd like to say good morning from New Holland Baptist Church. Let's pray for just a moment, please. Our Father, we know that today as we celebrate Palm Sunday, that Jesus rode the, the back of a donkey into Jerusalem. And Father, they yelled, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, tonight, and today, Father, we will proclaim the fact of Jesus Christ, the one who has come in the name of the Lord. Father, use what we, we offer today. Father, be glorified by every song that's sung. And Father, we pray that you will encourage the hearts of those who hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we would like to encourage you to sing along at home. The songs that we have chosen are songs that are familiar, and I think that you will get a blessing out of participating. We serve a great big God. Let's sing How Great Is Our God. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. And trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And Paul will sing, how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands. And time. Above all names. Sing this with us. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. 
we serve a great big God and we glorify his name and we glorify his name in all the earth. This song, you can sing with us. This is like a prayer. Spirit, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. ready for just a moment. I want you to think about a great song, a great that you've heard. You've heard the words forever. Enjoy and be blessed by the choir singing for God so loved the world.
Thanks for uh, coming in and joining in with us. And uh, I want to talk to you today, and mostly I'm going to talk to you out of the book of Matthew, uh, but we also will look a little bit into John chapter 11. And I want to talk about a walk with Christ through trials. A walk with Christ through trials. I think sometimes, uh, because we know that Jesus was always the Son of God, and he was, every moment that he was on this earth, he was born uh, of Mary, but also born of the Father. So that meant he was 100% human, born of Mary, but he was 100% God, born of the Father. But I think sometimes because we know he was the Son of God, we forget that he was the Son of Man. And, and he walked through this world in the same way that we do. He prayed because he needed prayer. He needed that closeness and that relationship in his, in his life with God. Just the same way we need prayer. He faced difficulties. He faced difficult people. He faced uh, obstacles, and, and, and there were times that there were stories told of towers falling on people. There were tragedies that occurred. People would come to him and say, Lord, why did this happen? And people wanted to know the, the significance of life, the meaning of life, and what was it that God wanted to, to do in them as they were walking through this thing called life. And Jesus did it. He was the example. He was the one that we needed to follow. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest uh, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, and then he says these words, yet without sin. So that tells us that our high priest, our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ, God's salvation, the, the Son of God who came to earth, born in the manger, grew up and lived a very quiet life for 30 years, who uh, Philippians 2 said did not think it uh, something to be grasped to be equal with God, but he laid it down. He made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant. He came to this world so that he could be my Savior and your Savior. He came to fulfill a mission. We needed someone who had never sinned, but yet who faced the difficulties and the hardships of life. Some people kind of think it was like this. They think that Jesus walked through life, and then if he uh, had a difficulty or a problem, then he would pull out the God card, and, and he supernaturally would just uh, sweep through it, and, and he would never be uh, touched with the difficulties like we are. If that was the case, then he would not have been the perfect Lamb of God to give his, to give his life for us. He had to know what it was like. He had to know what it was like to, to be tempted in all ways, yet without sin. He had to know what it was like for me to have to walk this earth. So I think if we could just follow the, the, the example, the pattern, the life of Christ, we could find a great way that we too can look to the Father for strength and help and, and, and wisdom and understanding, and we too could face the difficulties of life, and we could do them the way God would have us to. So let's learn from these. So I've, what I've done is I've taken about the last 10 days of Christ's life here before the cross. And we're going to look at some examples of what he had to face that week. Man, what a difficult time. It, could you think of the crescendo of his life? The, the plan was set in place before the foundation of the world, but it had to be walked out. Jesus had to be willing to go through it. And that last week, Listen, Son of God, knowing what was coming, knowing the cross was coming, and yet having to face it every day. There are plenty of things in my life and in your life where we knew that we had difficult things to face that day, and it didn't make it easier, but we would go to the Father, and that would make it easier. And we would say, not my will, thy will be done. And, and we, could, we could walk with him, and his will could be done in our life. And our life could bring glory into him. So I want to share some things from uh, Jesus' last 10 days so that we could um, understand kind of what it is that, that he went through. And the first one I want to talk about is the time when Lazarus became sick and, and word came to him from Mary and Martha that he was sick and he was with his disciples. And Jesus didn't get in a hurry. Now, once again, he, he was connected with God and he understood that this was a sickness unto death, but yet he delayed his time 
And, and he, he went, and when he got there, it was four days later. Now, I, I'm saying that to tell you this. Just a little over a week before he would have to, have to go to the cross, God allowed a circumstance to go on in the life of Jesus so he would face the crisis of death, burial, and the power of the resurrection. It would be the forefront of his purpose in life of coming. As a matter of fact, when he was talking to one of the sisters in John eleven twenty five, 25, the, word, the scripture says this, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. He hadn't, he, he hadn't been to the cross yet, but he was walking his life in faithfulness and, and uh, fulfilling the mission that God had for him. And one of the things God allowed was God allowed him to confront death in his friend, Lazarus. Burial, and by the time he got there, he had been in the grave four days. And he confronted the, the human condition with Martha running out to him and saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They saw that Jesus had the power to heal. They just didn't have the understanding that he was the resurrection and the life. Jesus was going to show them something in, the, in him that he would fulfill on the cross. But before he could show them that, he had to face it. I've always been amazed and blessed by the fact that when Jesus went to the tomb where Lazarus was and he told them to, um, to open the door, uh, open the, roll, roll the stone away from the grave, that they said, Lord, it's been four days by this time I like the old King James here. He stinketh, right? Uh, the, the natural things of life, the, the decay of the body is there. Jesus faced the death and the burial. He faced the own personal loss and the shortest scripture in the New, New Testament. Jesus wept. He knew how they felt. He felt that way too. The emotions that God gives us helps us confront the crisis of life and at that moment, though he knew he was going to resurrect Lazarus, he still was confronted with the difficulty. And when he said those words, Lazarus come forth, he came face to face with what he would do on Resurrection Sunday, when death would lose its grip, when the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon the, the words of God through Jesus Christ, and life would come back. Life beautifully put together, as only God can give would come back. So what can we learn from this? I, I, I was thinking about this, and, and I, I, I wrote down this. We must confront our crisis before we can ever act on our salvation. We're going to go through difficulties and hardships, and we've got to be there. We've got to face those difficulties. We've got to face those crises before we'll ever see the power of God's salvation work through those crises. Jesus saw it before he went to the cross. We face our crisis so we can see the same power of the resurrection of life in our life. The second scenario that I was thinking about was in uh, Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, when Jesus came to uh, enter Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on today. And he got to that place and uh, the crowd was there and, and the expectation was there and, and people began to, to get excited in God and, and see the possibility, see the hope that was there and they began to say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There was, there was hope that they had in God that they saw in Jesus' life. And, and I, I got to think about when they said to, to the others, uh, they said, uh, they said, Jesus, tell them not to say these things. And he said, uh, if they must praise me. If, if not, the rocks will cry out. Uh, you know, what amazed me about this, though some were shouting salvation, others were shouting, why? Why are they saying this? And, and some said, well, don't you understand? He's the prophet. 
even though they were sa saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they still at this point in time didn't see him as anything other than a prophet. They saw him as a prophet of God, but they didn't really see him as the Savior yet. But I, I, what can we learn from this? We look and we cast a, a hopeful eye for the future. As we're going through the crisis of today, and we have the great times today, we're still faced with crisis. And though we have times when, when we can celebrate the goodness of God together and, and the blessedness of being saved and knowing Him and, and the peace that goes beyond all understanding, yet we know there's something better coming. Some may say, hey, He's just a prophet. A lot of people in the world call Jesus a prophet, but I know Him to be more than that. And I'm looking for Him to become in my life more than that. The third thing I want to, uh, I, I was thinking about this was the, the next day after Jesus uh, uh, came in on that Palm Sunday, he went to the, the temple. And when he went to the temple there, he, he, he looked and, and he saw the, the, all the people selling the animals in the temple. And by the way, a lot of times uh, scripture tells us in the book of uh, Leviticus that those animals were to be uh, a certain type of animal. And they were to not have any blemish on them whatsoever. But what they would do a lot of times uh, would sell the, the diseased animals and the, the ones with uh, uh, hurt legs or, or not so uh, perfect animals. But they would sell them for an inflated price because every Jewish family who came to Jerusalem wanted to be able to give a lamb for their family, a, a sacrifice for their family. And Jesus looked at that and said, you know, this is evil. When he saw the, the people who uh, were coming to give their, their temple tax, and they had the currency of the world, but, but the, the, the religion of the day was said that you had to give it in temple money. So they would uh, have to go to the, the money changers and they would have to change it from their currency to temple money. And they would add in an excess fee for them to do this. And when Jesus saw the people taking advantage of selling the animals at inflated prices and, and, and diseased animals, uh, unclean animals, and saw those people trying to make money over other people who were trying to be faithful to God and the religion, he started to, to kick over the money changers' tables and, and take a, uh, ropes and put them together and, and to, to run out the animals because he, he said, you're not going to take my father's house that is supposed to be a, a house of prayer and make it into a den of thieves. What can I learn from this? What can we learn of this? During this time, we need to be very, very careful, as we always, of old religion. We need to have something that is a relationship with God. We never follow religion. We always follow Christ. We don't want anything that's man-made. We want things that's heaven sent. We want things that will stand on the solid rock of Christ. And though the church was, was created by God, it is the people of God. We are the church, not the building, not the, the organization. But so, so let's, let's be very careful of, of, of man's religion. Let's be very weary during these crisis times and the, the difficulties of putting too much uh, on man. Let's put all of our worship and honor and glory in God. And as the pastor of the church, you're going to hear me say amen, amen, and amen. I, I, I'm not your priest. I, I'm your, I'm your under-shepherd. Uh, I may not be the one, but I can point you to the one. And I'm grateful that God's allowed me to do uh, all the things that he's done. So uh, uh, in the confrontation that we found in the temple, we, we, we want to make sure that our, our allegiance is to God. And, and let's be very careful about man-made religion. The fourth thing is I, I, I thought about the life when, when Jesus was walking into the, to the temple every day. Uh, that last week, he would go into the temple, but then he would leave in the evening, and usually he would go to, to Bethany, about a two- or three-mile walk. But one day as he was walking in, he saw a fig tree. Y'all remember the story? And when he saw the fig tree, Matthew 26, he, he, he ran over to it, and, and, and because all the leaves were on it, it had all the signs of where there could be fruit. So he was wanting some figs. So he went over there to, to get figs, but when he found it, it was the right time. It had all the leaves on it. It had all the appearance as if it should have fruit, but it was, it was barren. 
And Jesus, because of that, he saw that as a sign of hypocrisy. And Jesus cursed the hypocrisy of that tree. The only time you're going to find that Jesus cursed something. Jesus cursed the tree. Then he went on into Jerusalem. The next day, that evening, they went home. And the next day, as they were coming back, and they were traveling the same place, they looked over at the tree, and the tree was completely withered. And the disciples were amazed by it. How did this happen so quickly? We were just here yesterday. We, I remember when Jesus cursed this tree, and look how quickly this tree has fallen. When I, what can I find from that? I, I find that uh, Jesus is a God that is about blessing. And God wants to bring blessings. God, John 15 said, said uh, uh, we are the vine, he is the, uh, uh, or we are the, he, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches, the Father is the vine dresser. Basically, we are to be abiding in Christ because we cannot do anything of our own, but we are the thing that the vine, Jesus Christ, hangs fruit on. Jesus wants to produce his fruit in us. God expects fruit. God wants fruit from our life. God does not want to see hypocrisy in our life. God does not want us to be barren in our life. We must come to him. We must surrender to him. We must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. We must seek to do his will. Not our will. We must seek to follow his truth, not our truths. We must submit every day and, and choose to follow him. It is our choice. It cannot be uh, a choice if we don't have the ability to do that. It cannot be love unless we choose to love. We must come and, and, and give our life unto him. But let me just remind you, God blesses life. Everything that has life bears fruit. Amen? But please hear this. He curses that which doesn't have fruit. May our life be about fruit. I'm praying for the day that our country bears fruit again. I'm praying for the day that the churches have fruit again. I'm praying for the day where everyone has a burden to yield their heart and life unto God and just say, Lord, do in me what only you can do, but do it for the sake of, of Jesus. Do it for the glory of God. So let me talk to you about the fifth Thing that I see in the life of Christ. When Jesus was at Simon the leper's house, at the, at the home of someone who had one time been a leper, but had found the healing of God, Jesus had healed him of his leprosy, and now his life is about giving back to God, being blessed by God, so thankful for all the things that God has done for him. And now Jesus is gathered together, and he's in, he's in Simon's house, and and the disciples are there, and, and someone busts through. Scripture tells us it was Mary. Mary, the sister of Martha, and the sister of Lazarus. And she comes in with, a, with an alabaster box of the, of the greatest, most expensive uh, fragrance of, uh, of the day. And she comes and she breaks it, and she anoints Jesus' feet. I just am amazed by this because she's doing it as an act of worship. She doesn't care about everyone else around her. Judas Iscariot and some of the others probably joined in and said, why was this waste? And could you imagine somebody doing something so awesome and somebody else there trying to find fault in it? There's always going to be someone who finds fault. But Jesus comes to, to her defense and said to, in, in Matthew 26, verse 6, said, She did this for my burial. Now you're going to fast forward a little bit. And when Jesus was crucified that day, they came because of the Passover, and, and they were going to break the legs of those that were on the crosses that day. But when they came to Jesus, they didn't break his legs because he had already given his life and, and said those words, Father, unto my, thy hands I commend my spirit. And he had given his life. So they didn't break his legs that day. They put the spear into his side and the blood and the water came out. But, but 
they quickly took him down from, after they got permission, they quickly took him down from the cross and wrapped him up. And they didn't have time to, to anoint him for the burial. And so uh, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they took that time to, to wrap him up and get him into Joseph's tomb before sundown, before the end of that day and Passover came because they would have been unclean to take the Passover. But here, of all the times that Jesus had said to them, I am going to Jerusalem, I will be taken, and I will be crucified, and I will be buried, and three days later I will rise again. Isn't it funny that Mary was really one of the few that just absolutely heard that, believed that, and acted upon it? So when she found the opportunity, she comes into that room, she breaks the alabaster box, she, she anoints Jesus' feet, and Jesus knew it. Listen, during the time when his heart was breaking, when the most difficult, the weight of the world was on his shoulders, walking through that week, talking with those people, and uh, the, the Pharisees and the scribes who should have been bringing him praise, the Herodians and the scribes, uh, the people of the word who should have came and said, this is the one that the word of God has told us about. Yet they tried to trip him up and, and they didn't give him honor and glory. But this woman did. And she said, Jesus said, she has done this for my burial. Jesus was facing his death even now. The thought of the Son of God, the God of yesterday, today, and forever, being laid in a tomb where he would be the sign of uh, the prophet Jonah, laid there for three days, three nights before the resurrection. We talk about the death a lot. We talk about the life a lot. And those things are vital to our salvation. But we do not need to forget the humility of the life that was given. <clears throat> the time of the burial of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he faced it. He looked at it. He submitted to it. He allowed it. I don't think we uh, realize the fullness when we look at the cross. Even today, I, I put myself in this position because of the cross. And last week, I, I, I didn't know how to light up the cross, but I I found out how to put the backlight on the cross because even when I preach this message, I want us to remember, may we never forget that all we have in Christ and in God, we have nothing if it were not for the cross, for the gift. When I think of the sixth thing, when I look at Jesus' last week, I, I want to talk about the Judas Iscariot, the betrayal. The one that Jesus had walked with for over three years. The one who had slept on the other side of the fire many times. The one that he had eaten with. The one that he had joked with. The one that he had prayed for. The one that uh, uh, he had always ministered to. The one he had treated in such a way that no one saw that he had treated Judas in any other way than he treated everyone else. He always treated him with love even though he always knew that Judas would be the one who would betray him. He had an upfront view of Christ, and yet he turned his back on Christ for 30 pieces of silver, the piece of a common slave, the, the cost of a common slave. To see the child of God, the son of God, the power of God, the one who could heal the blind and the lame and the sick and the lepers and the unclean and, and could take bread and, and fish and feed the thousands. And he could be actually be a part of that. But yet, knowing all that, there was something inside of him that overruled everything that he saw in Christ because there was still something about him that was so very short-sighted so very self-seeking. What can we learn from that? There will always be people who stand against Christ. There will always be people who stand against the cross of Calvary. There will always be people who stand and walk away from truth. And we've got to accept that. I think the thing that uh, Jesus was confronted with that we must remember as well is that though he knew that he would go to the cross of Calvary 
as John 3.16 says, to make it possible for anyone so, so, so that none could perish, but all could come to repentance. Please understand this. He still knew that some would still follow the self-seeking way rather than seeking God. Even when he was on the cross, we see the three crosses, one on one side, who said, remember me when you enter your paradise. And the other one said, why are you, why are you praying that? Yeah. One was a believer, one was not. Christ had to face those that were always going to be against him. By the way, we will always see those people that will be against Christ. It's not us they're rejecting, it's Christ they're rejecting. Number seven, I want us to think about the Passover meal. I want us to think that time when he told them that they had to go and prepare the meal, and they did. The lamb that would be prepared. The sacrifice. That's what the Passover meant to the Jews. Going back to their time of slavery in Egypt where the lamb would have to give his life, the blood would go over the lentils and everyone who passed under the blood would be safe from the death angel. Symbolically, he was having to face that. He was having to walk it out. When he took the bread, the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them to show his body that would be broken. When he took the cup, the wine that symbolized his blood, the blood that he would shed hours later, for the sins of the world. All the sins for anyone who would come and, and believe. What can we learn from this? We need to remember the price paid for our salvation. We need to remember that when we face the difficulties of life, Christ paid the propitiation for our sins. He made the way so that we may have life and that we have, have it abundantly. And it was a unbelievable price and we should never make light of the substitutionary death of Christ we should never see it as a small thing of that which cost Christ everything and then I think of that night of the disciple Peter and how he asserted himself when he told them that they would betray him and he he's like Lord I will never leave you he stood up in his, his flesh. Jesus even said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. When he was with them in the garden that night. But he said, uh, Lord, though everyone else may leave you, the rock will never leave you. The rock will never forsake you. Yet that night, that's exactly what he did. What can we learn from this? We may face the difficulties of life, but learn this and know this well. We cannot do it on our own. Though you may feel you can, you can't. You need Christ. You most definitely and completely need Christ. You see, I think Peter meant it when he said those words. The rock will stay with you. The rock will never forsake you. And in our will, there are plenty of times that we say we're going to do something, but we need to fall on our face before God and confess our sins to him and, and know that we can't do anything. But, you know, I love what Jesus says in, in John chapter number five. Uh, in John five, it says this, verse 19, most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. And in verse 30, he says, I can do nothing of myself. Did you hear that? Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. And if walking this earth in, in the form of the Son of Man, if Jesus says he can't do it on it by himself, that lets me know I can't do it on my own. So I want to face every difficulty, every crisis, and I want to lower my wisdom and claim his wisdom. I want to lower my strength because when I am weak, then God can make me strong. I want to be able to say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I need to understand and know, I'm, I can't do it. But oh, we can do all things if Christ signs off on it. If Christ gives us that ability. And then I want you to think of the time when Jesus was taken. 
I want you to think of the time when he was abused and whipped and mocked and beaten. They spat in his face. They cursed him. They plucked at his beard. They tried him. They mocked him. They screamed, crucify him, crucify him. They sentenced him to death as if they had the power to do that. Those soldiers laid him on the cross and drove the nails through his hands and his feet. And Jesus never fought back. He never said a word. The substitutionary death of God, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. And yet, may we never forget the veil was torn in two. Jesus, when he said those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he came, became my sin. He took upon himself the sins of the world. And the Father, for the first time in eternity, separated from the Son because the Father can't look at sin. How deep the Father's love for us. How wonderful and amazing the Savior's love for us to come. What can we learn from this? There is no other way other than Christ. There has been no sacrifice other than the sacrifice of Christ. Yes, other people have, in this life have actually tried to mimic and do what Christ did and and actually allowed themselves to be crucified after Jesus' crucifixion because they wanted to join in the pain. But there's no way they can feel the pain of the sins of the whole world. There's no way they can feel the pain of the separation and the betrayal like, like Jesus did. There's no way they could feel the separation from the eternity of, of, of the love of God like Jesus did in that moment, though he was always eternal with God. And the hope of the... the the three days later, the hope of the re resurrection was never lost. It was always there. Jesus is the only way. What does that tell me? Don't look for another way because he's the only way. Why do we trust in ourselves? Just trust in Christ. Lastly, I just want us to remember the truth of the death, the truth of the burial. And please hear this. The power of the resurrection. I want us to remember the way of the resurrection I want us to remember that death leads to life. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The best way, the best way we can do that is coming to the end of ourself, facing the difficulties and the hardships of life and saying to that Lord, this life that you allowed us to live is a gift. You gave us this gift and you wanted us to live this life with you, but we have sinned. We have gone our own way and we, had, we don't have any take backs. We can't take it back away. That sin has left a scar. It's left a separation. It's left a gap. It's, it's, it's left us broken. And there's no way that we can ever find our way back to you other than the gift of the salvation of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So we come to God and we say, Lord, we believe. We believe that you are the Son of God. We believe that you came to become the Son of, Son of Man. We believe that you humbled yourself and, and walked this life. We believe that you faced every temptation. And, and yet without sin, you know how we feel. You know what we're going through. And Lord, we believe that you're listening to this prayer right now. And because we believe, we repent of our sins. We know there's nothing good within us, but we claim what you did for us. We, we claim the substitutionary death that you died for us on the cross. I take the blood that you shed, and Lord, I want it for me. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and save me. We need to pray this. All my life I give to you. Lord, make me new, make me whole, make me a child of the King. The Bible says whoever believes these things, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. 
I refuse to make salvation more difficult than Jesus did. But I refuse to take away and to say that it's less than what Jesus said. You must come by the way of the cross. You must believe. You must repent of your sins. And you must choose to follow him. You must give your heart and life to him. A life that he can hang fruit on and be a blessing to others. This is the gospel story. This is the gospel message. May it never be forsaken. May it never be overlooked like Judas took it and overlooked it. May it be accepted. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall become as white as snow. I hope that you've heard this uh, heartfelt message. And if you've never come to a place in time in your life when you've given your heart and life to Christ, cried out to him and told him that you believed in him and that you know that he died for you and that you repented of your sins and asked him to come into your heart and life and told him that for the rest of your days, you wanted his life to be your life, that you were going to be a disciple and a follower of Christ. If you've never done that, there's no better time. Listen to me. There's no better time than right now. Nothing in all of heaven and earth is standing in the way except your will. And if you will present your life and your will to him, the Bible says he will save you. I pray that you do that. And for those of you who have already done that, I pray that today you will be encouraged for what Jesus went through for you. May we never forget it. May we never uh, take it lightly. And may all of our days, may we live our life with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. May we love God with the completeness of who we are. And as he asks us to, may we love our neighbor in the same way. In the same way that he loved us, may we follow and serve him as we serve our neighbor. This is his commandment, and this is our honor. Thank you for listening. Pray God's blessings upon you during this difficult time. I know that you're facing crisis. I know that you're facing things that you've never faced before, but it's okay. God's got this, and he wants to bless you. God bless you as you look to him. Thank you for uh, watching us today, uh, tuning in with us. Hope that everything that's been said and done has been a blessing to you. I hope that your life has been encouraged. Hope that you found strength in him. If we could be any help to you in any way, reach out to us. You can call the church office. You can call uh, my, my cell phone. Uh, you can call Mark. Uh, you can email us at the church at uh, newhollandbc at uh, bellsouth.net. Uh, reach out to us in any way. We'd love to minister to you. If there's any prayer requests or any uh, um, needs that you know of in our community, please reach out to us. We will be doing this again next week on Resurrection Sunday. But until then, I pray that you have an absolutely blessed and wonderful week. In Jesus' name, let's go and let's, be, let's multiply. Let's tell the story of Christ everywhere that we go. Everywhere that we go. God bless you all.